My name is Miguel Leon, and I'm a program officer with the Michelson 20MM Foundation. Thank you all so much for joining us for part four of our Connecting California webinar series. Before we get started, and as we give folks a few minutes to hop on Zoom, I want to share a bit of background on our foundation and describe what we have in store for you today. Founded by Dr. Gary K. Michelson and Alia Michelson, the Michelson 20MM Foundation is dedicated to ensuring the equitable post-secondary educational opportunities that lead to meaningful careers are accessible to all. We operate at the cutting edge of higher education to help forward-thinking entrepreneurs, nonprofits, and startups close the opportunity gap. Connecting California aims to increase awareness of the impacts of digital inequity, as well as explore case studies of proven models and solutions implemented in state and around the country. Our convenings also intend to provide a forum for philanthropic leaders to explore and redefine their role and relationship to the digital divide with an eye to both near-term needs made more urgent by COVID-19, as well as necessary long-term solutions that can sustainably help close the digital divide. Through Connecting California, we hope to develop a strong coalition that is committed to solving digital inequity in California once and for all. Our convening today, Build Back Better, Digital Equity in the Biden-Harris Administration, will focus on giving us deeper insight into what President Biden, Vice President Harris, and their new administration plans to do to hopefully eradicate digital inequity. Following President Biden's pledge to make digital equity a cornerstone of his administration, we hope to share insight on the government's approach to technology policy and how the Biden-Harris administration can lead on one of the most potentially transformative economic development investments of the century. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that you will be able to ask questions via the Zoom Q&A function. We'll be dedicating the last portion of our webinar to answering some, if not all, your queries. And with all that said, it's my pleasure now to introduce Phil Kim, president of the Michelson 20MM Foundation, who will share welcoming remarks. Phil. Thank you, Miguel, um, and thank you to the Michelson 20MM team. Myra, Hannah, Alyssa, and Rachel for working so tirelessly to uh, bring us all together once again. Uh, good morning, everyone. We have a vitally important and timely conversation set for today. So I'd like to jump right in and first introduce our moderator. Um, Adrian Furness is executive director, board member, and trustee at the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society, a private operating foundation that since 1981 has been working toward the goal of providing everyone equal access to open, affordable, high-performance broadband as a means to deliver opportunity, strengthen communities, and ensure a thriving democracy. Currently, Adrian serves on the Board of Advisors for the Coalition for Local Internet Choice and as Secretary and Executive Committee Member of the Board of Directors for PCs for People. She is also joined by Gigi Son, Distinguished Fellow at the Georgetown Law Institute for Technology, Law, and Policy, and Senior Fellow and Public Advocate at the Benton Institute. For over 30 years, Gigi has worked to defend and preserve the fundamental competition and innovation policies that have made broadband internet access more ubiquitous, competitive, affordable, and open. Previously, she was counselor to former FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler, co-founder and CEO of Public Knowledge, project specialist in the Ford Foundation's Media Arts and Culture Unit, and executive director of the Media Access Project, as well as being a member of President Clinton's Advisory Committee on the Public Interest Obligations of Digital Television Broadcasters. Lastly, we are honored to have with us Catherine DeWitt, manager of the Broadband Research Initiative at the Pew Charitable Trusts. Before joining Pew, she was an associate with Booz Allen Hamilton, focusing on telecom, cybersecurity, and economic development issues. She has also been a senior fellow with the Heinz Endowments. At the Endowments, she led philanthropy efforts focused on youth engagement, place-based grant making, and regional economic development. Thank you so much, Adrienne, Gigi, and Catherine, for joining us today. Um, I'd like to now turn it over to our founder and chair, Dr. Gary Michelson. Um, Dr. Michelson is one of the world's most prolific inventors with over 900 patents to his name. He and his wife, Alia, have committed the majority of their vast resources towards charitable endeavors as catalytic, catalytic philanthropists. Dr. Michelson? Well, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, do we have the superintendent with us yet? He is uh, hopping on, Dr. Michelson. He better hop quicker. <laughs> yeah, we uh, let his staff know. 
So given this panel, I feel like I should be getting educational credits for attending this Zoom. It's just uh, stellar. Uh, anyway, I think we're all aware of the many faces of social injustice and the failure to provide universal, low cost, high speed broadband is one of those. As Amanda Gorman recently said, the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always justice. In this spirit of refusing to just go along and to demand and cost change, it really is my pleasure to introduce my friend, the state of California's great superintendent of public instruction, Tony Thurman, who I hope will tell us about the exciting broadband technology innovation challenge that he has organized. Thank you all. Um, but nothing would keep us from being connected in this moment. Uh, thank you for your incredible and impassioned and hard charging leadership on this issue. There is no reason that California or any state in this great nation should allow our students to go without access to high speed internet, to computers and digital tools that not only connect them during a pandemic, but literally should be the tools that connect them uh, to the jobs of tomorrow, to whatever it is that they are passionate about doing. I know that you and the 20 Million Minds Foundation have really, you're not new to this conversation. You've been having this conversation about digital literacy, about making it easier for students to get access to things that, you know, resources they can't always afford, but could be made available electronically for them at no cost or low cost. And so thank you for your, your, your leadership and vision. And thank you for the push that you've given that has turned into what we call the innovation challenge. Uh, your, your belief that we have to find a way, whether through competition, to, to do what Californians and Americans have always done, innovate to find the next great solution for closing the digital divide. And because of your push, we find ourselves in a position to have launched this innovation challenge where we can provide a million dollar cash prize to someone who comes up with the next big thing, the game changer for closing the digital divide. And so what we think is gonna happen is that someone who is a researcher or an entrepreneur or an innovator or a university research team is gonna figure out a way to take internet capabilities to the next level. Maybe it will be some kind of a riff off of what they do with satellite. Maybe it'll be some other technology we've never seen before, but we are using this cash prize. We're using this innovation uh, uh, challenge to say that we can and we must do better for California's young people. So thank you, uh, Dr. Michelson, for not only lifting up the idea, but putting your energy behind it, your resources behind it. We're hopeful that the partners here today will look for ways that they'll get involved. We're still looking for investments and anyone could be a part of the solution. Uh, we all have a responsibility to our 6 million students, about a million of them right now without the internet. There is no way that you can tell me that this is a problem that we cannot solve in short order. And so we're glad to be your partner. Um, the innovation challenge is officially underway. We're challenging you to help us close the digital divide right now and right away. Superintendent, Dr. Michelson, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for being the leader on this. You get the credit, you've been the leader, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michelson, for your leadership and your push and together we'll get it done. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Thurman. Thank you, Dr. Michelson. I will, I will turn it over now to Adrian Furness from the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society. Adrian. Thank you very much, Miguel, and good morning, California. Um, I appreciate the kind introduction uh, from myself and my fellow panelists today, but I do want to extend my thanks to Michelson 20MM Foundation for asking me back to Connecting California this time as the moderator of Build Back Better Digital Equity in the Biden-Harris administration. So over the last couple of years, in anticipation of a change in administrations, the Benton Institute spoke with policymakers, advocates, and practitioners around the country to create recommendations for a national broadband agenda. From those discussions, we learned that leaders at all levels of government need to embrace four building blocks of broadband policy, digital equity, deployment, 
competition, and the importance of community anchor institutions and community leadership. The ways people use broadband now have changed drastically with COVID-19, but our overarching goal is the same. Everyone in the US needs to be able to use high performance broadband and we need to make that possible as soon as we can. We are working with our allies to implement our recommendations, many of which grow out of the best practices of communities around the country that are taking the initiative to plan their own broadband futures. We at the Benton Institute, and I can speak for Catherine and Gigi here, have never been about broadband for broadband's sake. We care about harnessing broadband's potential to improve people's lives, our communities, and our democracy. So it's heartening that to further President Joe Biden's four top policy priorities, combating COVID-19, uh, enabling economic recovery, addressing racial equity, and dealing with climate change, the Biden-Harris administration has articulated that broadband has a key role to play. Whether it is delving, I'm sorry, whether it is delivering telehealth, jobs through construction of networks as part of an infrastructure package, digital literacy training and affordability to close the digital equity gap, or applications for farmers to more sustainably manage their land and outputs, or for cities to implement smart grid technology. We can't build back better without broadband. So I'm here today with two broadband experts that uh, were introduced so ably by Phil, thank you. Um, and they both played a critical role in advising the Biden-Harris transition. Um, with Miguel, uh, we had discussions with Miguel and Hannah before the panel, and they asked us to talk about the importance of digital equity in the Biden-Harris administration and point to some of the stark policy differences between the last administration and this one. So the sad reality <clears throat> is that over the four years of the Trump administration, all of us who care about broadband for all were really playing defense. And we were trying to protect the gains made over the eight years of the Obama administration and often watching in horror as many public interest policies were rolled back or subjected to death by a thousand cuts. So Gigi, I'd like to start with you and you wrote this wonderful day one memo uh, called Restoring the FCC's Legal Authority to Oversee the Broadband Market. And you start that memo with the following sentence. The next FCC Federal Communications Commission leadership team must make a priority the restoration of the agency's authority to protect consumers and competition. So why don't you tell uh, our audience <clears throat> what former Federal Communications Commission Chairman Ajit Pai gave up in the restoring internet freedom order. Thanks Adrian, and, and thanks to, uh, to the foundation for having me here today. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, as a person who helped uh, write some of the most progressive communications policies while working for Tom Wheeler, I, I can just say it was enormously painful to watch them either get repealed quickly or picked to pieces or, you know, again, suffer death by a thousand cuts, as Adrian said. It was not, as, as, as a person, it was a, my first time in government, as a person who was, you know, some of the architect of some of these ideas, I, I can't think of any worse feeling, to be perfectly honest with you. So let me talk a little bit about what the Trump FCC did when it uh, issued its Restoring Internet Freedom Order. It did two things, okay? And people usually only remember one. The thing, the one thing that they remember is that the order repealed the FCC's 2015 network neutrality rules. And those are rules that prohibit broadband providers because they are bottlenecks to the internet. They are the on-ramp to the internet, prohibits them from blocking uh, certain internet traffic, throttling that traffic or slowing it down. 
were favoring any particular traffic, either for financial reasons or not. So really essential, particularly when you only have a handful of companies that control access to the internet, to make sure that they cannot discriminate and pick winners and losers over the internet. But the second thing it did, and this to me is far more important, was it abdicated the FCC's traditional role and responsibility to protect consumers and competition when it comes to broadband internet access. So in other words, the, the agency washed its hands of any and all oversight over the broadband market. Now, why is that important for this conversation? It's important because that authority also went to the, whether the FCC could have all the tools at its disposal to close the digital divide, including improving the Lifeline program, which is a subsidy for poor people, including uh, the high cost fund, which provides money for deployment, which includes you know, prohibiting redlining, digital redlining. So you know, prohibiting broadband providers from only serving wealthy communities as opposed to uh, in not wealthy communities. It prohibited them from protecting consumers from price gouging or fraudulent billing. So it was shocking to me that an agency that for 80 years had been tasked with ensuring affordable and open access to communications networks gave up that responsibility when it came to the access to the most important network of our lifetimes. Thank you, Gigi. And I wanted to start there just because I think it sets the tone for the differences between the prior administration and this one. And I also just want to start someplace else before we get to addressing the affordability issue and the lifeline program, which you raised, Gigi, which is that the Pi Federal Communications Commission rushed out its annual broadband deployment report in January before PI left the agency, retaining a standard that the commission had first adopted over five years ago, saying that 25.3 speeds still constitute real broadband. And critics, including two uh, FCC commissioners, Rosen, Warsaw, and Starks, decried the decision. So why, Catherine, is keeping that benchmark speed at 25.3 a digital equity issue? Uh, well, at its most basic level, uh, it puts a cap on what people can actually use broadband to do. It ignores the realities of modern usage. 25.3 um, is, on its best day, sufficient for one person in a household to check their email, maybe watch a video, live stream, but it's not really engineered to uh, for how we are using it, particularly now during a pandemic. Um, you know, as a policy researcher, um, I, I think one of the things that we have looked at consistently and why we are so interested and uh, encouraged by states setting higher speed uh, goals and coverage goals um, is that when you set these low speeds, when you are essentially racing to the bottom, let's provide the bare minimum, um, we are putting ourselves in a position where we are constantly using public funds to upgrade networks to these standards that just get gradually moved up over time. That's not efficient. It's also not effective. Um, it also ignores the fact that we really rely on broadband to do everything today. And this is no longer a luxury good. Candidly, it never really was, but it no longer is a luxury good uh, where it's just about watching cat videos and Netflix, um, which again, like kind of laughable that that was the argument to begin with, but you know, we'll set that aside. Mm -hmm. um, but what we're seeing now, whether we are talking about allowing folks to age in place, whether this is about accessing distance education, um, you know, accessing workforce training and upskilling opportunities, just staying connected to friends and family, you have to have a high speed reliable connection that is both high speed download and upload in order to do that and do it well. Um, the final thing that I'll point out, and this was something that we heard um, during my team's research, field research in California, is that setting these lower speed goals also sort of ignores uh, the businesses that are run out of homes um, and out of um, out of properties, and um, you know it, it is ignoring the fact that farmers, for example, 
need to be able to use these connections to upload reporting requirements, both to the state and to the federal government. So when we, one, set artificially low speed goals, and then two, ignore um, the real needs of individual users, both residential and small business, um, we are setting ourselves up to use public funds inefficiently and to Adrienne's point, um, reinforcing issues of digital inequity. You know, and I think the important, one of the important things you said was that it's become more and more about upload speeds yes. and not down. So a lot of our recommendation is symmetrical speeds are becoming increasingly important. Gigi, did you want to add to this? No, I think, she, I think Catherine has really said it all. And again, it, it, just to ex express some frustration, you know, year in and year out, the FCC has to do a report that's, that tells Congress to mandate uh, whether broadband is being deployed on a reasonable and timely basis. And uh, one of the things that they do in that report is determine what the benchmark speed should be. And for four years, even though we set that 25-3 speed, I think it used to be 4-1, right? Four, mm -hmm. I guess I can yeah. one up. We four set one, that one. In, in, in 2014, they stubbornly refused to, to raise that speed. Why? Because it looked a lot better for them to say, oh, look how many people have 25-3 uh, across the nation, even though even pre-pandemic, as Catherine said so well, uh, it was completely inadequate. Mm -hmm. I think the, um, the other component that I will add here is, um, and you're going to hear us talk a lot about this in this panel, so I apologize that we're starting early, but this is why having um, funders and community-based funders and community organizations, um, having them at the table is so important um, because you know what your communities need. Um, you know, I share this example a lot about hearing from state legislators and a community organization based in a, a state in the Midwest who said, you know, they're talking to data and mapping and broadband experts and they're pointing out structures on a property and saying, oh, these structures don't need, they don't need broadband access. And the leader of the local farm bureau was like, that's a hog barn. They do need access to that. So having community leaders like all of you at the table engaged in these conversations is really essential because you can base these statements and stories and fact and evidence for why we have to have higher speeds that are also affordable, which we'll get to. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, the, Grant. <laughs> that is the perfect segue, Catherine. Thank you so much. Happy to help. <laughs> so I think the two of you would agree that the Trump FCC took and at best broadband uh, band-aid approach to addressing broadband affordability during COVID-19 with short-term unenforceable internet service provider pledges to not, disconnect, to not disconnect subscribers hurt during the economic downturn. And more importantly, as Gigi alluded to earlier, over the past four years, the PI FCC tried to kill the universal service program exclusively aimed at, low, at keeping low income households connected. And that program is called Lifeline. And he really did uh, seem to try to weaken the program at every turn. So at the end of 2020, Congress tasked the FCC led now by acting chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel with implementing a $3.2 billion emergency broadband benefit program. So Gigi, that's a big mouthful of a question because I've actually asked about affordability and given you a, uh, obviously two, two, two current programs or one current program and one that's emerging to talk about what the long-term strategy should be to address what I think we all think is the biggest uh, hurdle to broadband adoption, which is the cost of service. Yeah, and let me say, Adrian, I think you were much too kind to call the Trump administration's approach a Band-Aid approach. I, I don't think I ever heard the word affordability or cost come out of uh, Ajit Pai's mouth or anybody you know, anybody in the Trump administration, it was, you know, it, it was not a Band-Aid. It was, I think it was more of a takedown, as you mentioned, with Lifeline. So let me talk about this. And let me just reiterate something that both you and Catherine said, because I think it bears repeating. If we have any hope 
of dealing with the affordability issue, dealing with the infrastructure issues that affect more affect rural America, but also affect urban America. There's an awful lot of people yep. in cities, and they tend to be poor people and people of color uh, that are stuck using inadequate networks. Digital subscriber line, which some of you may not even know what that is. Let me just say it simply, it's slow, okay? It, it, it doesn't reach 25 three speeds. <laughs> Catherine would agree. So um, it's gonna, it has to, to fix this problem. And I think I've been saying it needs to be done in four years. Okay, the next four years, we need to close the digital divide. We need to get to what we have in telephone service, which is about 96% uptake. Hmm. We need to all gotta be all hands on deck, not just the hmm. FCC, although obviously it's a major player, but there are other federal agencies, the Department of Commerce, the Department of Labor, the Department of Education, Housing and Urban Development need to be engaged. The states are critical. I actually, Catherine and I will agree. We really think the states are where, where the action is right now. Yeah. Uh, because the federal government didn't do jack for the last four years, the, the states have stepped in and they said, gee, why did we ignore broadband or why do we give up our authority over broadband at, at the beginning of the millennium? And they're saying, why do we do that? That was really dumb. And you know, we need to take it back. So the states are really getting engaged, localities, philanthropies of all kinds, digital inclusion advocates and industry too, right? Uh, you know, industry has to be pushed and prodded uh, and you know, the free market's not gonna take care of this but they need to also be partners as well. So I just wanna reiterate that it's an all hands on deck approach. It's not one agency, it's not just states, it's not just federal. So here's the grand plan, okay? So let me just explain the emergency broadband benefit for those of you that don't know. So in the last COVID-19 uh, package that was passed in December, Congress passed, and this was a shocker to me because the House had passed it in March, in May, excuse me, and it had just languished at Mitch McConnell's door, a $50 a month broadband credit or $75 if you live on tribal land, okay? and appropriated $3.2 billion for it on an emergency basis, all right? And it goes not only to low-income families, but families where somebody has a Pell Grant, recently unemployed, uh, so, you know, broader actually than Lifeline. And um, it gave the FCC a very short amount of time to implement this program. So uh, the acting chairwoman has just circulated rules to implement the program, which includes things like marketing, things like you know, requirements for you know, who gets to be the provider that provides it and what are the eligibility requirements for participants. And uh, the FCC will be voting on that soon. And I will say, one of the goals of advocates like mine is to make this a permanent program. So to get this right, to get this program implemented correctly in a way that again, it's not hard if you want to get the benefit, if you are a person who meets one of those three categories and you want to get the benefit, you don't have to climb through hoops. Uh, if you're a provider, you don't have to climb through hoops either. That's really, really important. And that people actually know about it. And, and that's a theme I'm going to keep coming back to because we can provide all the money in the world. But if people don't know that the money is there and that there isn't, that there aren't digital inclusion advocates everywhere to help people know where those things are and get them online and get them to use the tools, then we'll have failed. Okay, the money will sit there in a bank. So well, I, 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 you just let me interject here. I think part of the challenge is that um, providers unprodded are just going to take their current subscribers and put them onto the program. And so it's really part of the challenge here is getting people who have been completely unconnected onto the program. Hence the obvious marketing, you know, whether it's through television or radio or through community-based organizations, why that's so important. Yeah, yep. exactly. could, could I also add, sorry, Gigi, did you wanna? I'll, I'll finish up, you go ahead. I was just gonna say the, this isn't a new problem. I mean, I think that that's the, like we're thrilled that more people are paying attention not only to the absence of infrastructure, but also to the affordability challenge. But like, this has been documented for well over a decade. Um, that's why California has, California, the state has a dedicated fund that is focused on broadband adoption and, and addressing affordability. It's also baked into the state's overall broadband strategy. It's one of the few states that does that. But like, 
So when Gigi is talking about, you know, these programs and how we need to make these programs work better and more people need to be aware of them, both Adrian and Gigi are absolutely right on that. But like, this isn't a new challenge, which also begs the question, what other information do we need to know in order to address the affordability challenge? Is this just about costs being passed on to consumers or do we need to reevaluate our public interventions and our public responses to think about how we fund programs to get folks online and then keep them online. Yeah, I mean, this is perfect segue because I was gonna say, that I, I think it's Sorry. critical to fund these digital equity and yeah. digital inclusion advocates. They are, they are absolutely necessary partners in, in, in making this money actually work. Let me just say one other thing, uh, well, two other things quickly. So the FCC has been funding Lifeline uh, and funding E-Rate, which is the, is the money that goes to schools and libraries for a connectivity. And now will, at least on an emergency basis, be used to connect K through 12 kids in the home, right? So one of the other things, if you wanna draw a contrast between the, between the, um, uh, the, the two administrations, Chairman Pai refused to make E-rate money available for home connectivity for school kids, claiming that the law did not allow him to do it. Uh, if anybody wants me to, to give a legal brief on why that's a nonsense argument, I will, but it's not, I don't need to, because the acting chairwoman is going to, on an emergency basis, allow that money to be used for home connectivity. And when there is a full complement of commissioners at the FCC, I hope that's gonna be soon, but who knows, I believe that they will make that, they will interpret the law to make that permanent. So just two really quick things is there's a fund that comes from the, the money on your, on your phone bill and only your phone bill, not your broadband bill, okay? Uh, that funds E-rate Lifeline, the high cost fund, which goes to deploying in rural areas and rural healthcare. It's called the Universal Service Fund. It is running out of money uh, and it is a, an emergency and it's running out of money because only telephone companies provide the money. So the F I believe the FCC needs to figure out a way to spread that contribution to universal service to a broader swath of companies. And I think, you know, everything should be on the table, including having tech companies pay. Uh, so that needs to be saved or all of those uh, programs are going to be at risk. Finally, and I think this is really important, it often gets caught, um, lost in the sauce. When the FCC restores its authority, which I believe it will, it will once again have the power to promote competition in the broadband market. Competition lowers prices, it makes service better. Uh, there are a number of things the FCC can do, and there's also a number of things that states can do and, and communities can do. They can build their own broadband networks. Uh, which always, almost always, not almost always, always drive the incumbents to lower their prices and make their service better. So promoting competition so there are more players in the space, uh, and this is something Congress could do as well, uh, is really, really important. So actually, Gigi, that, uh, it takes me a little bit out of order, but let me go to this question. Uh, because uh, Michael O'Reilly, who was a former FCC commissioner, used to rail against what he called overbuilding, um, essentially building these new broadband networks in areas that might already have a broadband network. And we think of overbuilding, it's just another name for competition. So let's talk about how promoting these community owned broadband or other alternative providers and innovative solutions is a good thing to enhance competition and what are the benefits? And Catherine, why don't I let you go if you don't mind? And if you want to toss it to Gigi, you can go ahead and do that. <laughs> uh, Gigi, I, I'm getting ready to scramble to take notes for things I wanted to say. Uh, but Gigi is certainly the, uh, the authority on this. I mean, I think what I will say though is that one of the challenges with overbuilding is first that it assumes that every household within those communities that are considered served, I'm using air quotes here, actually have connections. So there's, there's that component to it. Um, challenge, particularly when we're talking about competition, is also assuming that every community 
is going to be well suited for a competitive market. In some cases, that's just not true because your population density is low. You know, they need one service provider and that's it. But also in those in those communities, everybody needs to get online because if that one provider that's providing those services isn't connecting them, that's it. They're not going to get there. So I think that there is a lot of, um, we do ourselves a disservice by using words like overbuilding when we don't even guarantee universal service with the builds that already exist to begin with. Sorry, that didn't really, did that. hopefully that made sense. I'm gonna turn it over to Gigi. Well, but, Ka but Catherine is picking up, Catherine and I talk a lot, particularly yeah. <laughs> is, is picking up on, I think uh, something that needs to be mentioned before I talk about community broadband and that is the lack of good data about who has broadband yeah. does not the lack of data about who has broadband because it cannot doesn't have broadband because they can't afford it as opposed to you know digital literacy as opposed to just because they don't have infrastructure uh the data is terrible the maps are terrible and as i've said many times before you can't make good policy with bad maps with bad data so that's i mean that's really that's the building block and it's great to see states like Maine and Georgia and others are starting to build their own maps uh, so they can they can make wise policy and funding decisions, but the, the federal government's been making poor decisions uh, because they don't really know who has broadband on any kind of granular level, who has broadband, who doesn't. So let me, let me turn to the, the, the community broadband because I think it's important pe for people to know that depending on who you talk to between 19 and 22 states, have laws that prohibit communities from deciding whether to build their own broadband networks or not. You know, and it's not for everybody, right? It's not a one size fits all solution, but the state should not be uh, telling mayors and, and uh, you know, city councils that you can't even consider it. And these were laws that were passed in the early part of the century at the behest of, uh, of large incumbent telephone companies uh, and cable companies. And they're, they're really, in a lot of states, they're killing innovation. Uh, young people are running away because if you don't have gigabit connectivity, it's very, very hard, particularly to attract young people. So um, it's interesting, Arkansas of all places just loosened their law, which prohibited the building of, of, of municipal broadband to allow more of it. So I think governors are starting to see the light so Catherine told me, I'm going to steal this from you, Catherine, that 31 governors in their state of the state address mentioned broadband is, 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 is something that they, you know, that they needed to get more of and, and work on. That's just like mind blowing. Mm -hmm. So the thing about a community broadband system is that, again, it's not focused on return on investment. It's focused on getting everybody connected. And there are different models. If I could just talk about the model that you're seeing more and more of. It's called open access middle mile. So in other words, the community takes the fiber that are in places like networks that are in places like schools and libraries and police stations and, and universities, and they cobble together a network. And then they tell commercial providers who provide the last mile to your home, come one, come all. And it's interesting, I talked to a big incumbent Telecom, who will remain nameless, and I mentioned, would you, because they, they just can't see their way to supporting community broadband. Oh, it's government competition and it's wrong, blah, blah, blah. When I mentioned this, which would give them an opportunity to provide last mile service in places where they don't today, they're like, oh, we might be able to support that. So that kind of model allows for a thousand flowers to bloom in, 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 I'll just give one example and then I'll be quiet. In Utah, uh, there's a, uh, a middle mile, open access middle mile network called Utopia that serves 15 mm -hmm. cities. And residents there have an average choice of 10 broadband providers, 10. Mm -hmm. How many choices do you guys have? I know particularly in Northern California, it's like one. Yeah. So, I mean, look, again, that kind of robust competition kind of harkens us back to where we were in the dial-up era where the average American had 13 uh, dial-up ISPs and prices were low. Yeah. So that's another way that you address the affordability problem is you just drive competition down, uh, excuse me, you drive prices down through competition. 
That's correct. Uh, but, uh, Catherine, are you allowed to talk a little bit about what's going on in West Virginia? Uh, yes, and I actually, um, thank you, I uh, was going to bring that up. I mean, you look at Utopia, you look at uh, projects like the Three Ring Binder in Maine, um, even Chattanooga's uh, fiber program, you know, those were significant public investments. Um, you know, they were funded with federal uh, Recovery Act dollars and some in large part. Um, the Utopia piece is burned into my brain because that was one of my first projects when I joined Booz Allen and was consulting and supporting those Recovery Act programs. Um, but what we are seeing in the state legislature in West Virginia right now is that they are um, focusing on allowing communities to build these open access networks, own that infrastructure in the same way that they might own a road, uh, and then contract with internet service providers to both uh, maintain and operate and provide service over that network. Um, why are they doing that? Uh, they're doing it because their argument is that the federal government hasn't achieved what they said they were going to do. Um, they are, in their words, tired of people who are not from West Virginia telling folks in West Virginia what to do. Uh, and so they are taking the reins on that. And I think the um, Gigi is absolutely right when we're talking about sort of this continuum of options, when we talk about community engagement and community-led models. Um, and it really is a continuum. I think you say the word municipal and people kind of like freak out a little bit and they're like, okay, call me, uh, back off. Like, it's okay, everybody's gonna be fine. Because in some cases it really is about communities engaging in a planning process or demonstrating demand or saying, these are the assets that we have, what can we do with it? Um, in some cases that leads to a public private partnership. Um, in other cases that leads to a fully private network and sometimes a fully public network. Um, but it's important, and I was laughing when Gigi said the 19 to 22 number about the number of states who have these limitations in place, because she's right, it is a range, depending on how you define it. Um, but the it's about having tools in the toolbox. So why remove, by putting limitations on municipal networks, um, by not allowing things like communications unions districts or like the equivalent of water districts, we're seeing this option pop up in states as well. Why remove those options from the table? Um, you know, they are a way to empower local leadership to bring local service providers to the table and sometimes large incumbents. Um, they also, in some cases, particularly with these uh, district models that are popping up, they offer opportunities for economies of scale. You're achieving efficiencies. These are good things. So why not throw every tool at this problem that we have uh, instead of actually removing, removing options? You know, Catherine, you mentioned that community engagement and planning mm -hmm. is part of this process, and we're running this program in the state of Illinois right now, engaging communities. But I just want to emphasize that sometimes when a, pro when a provider sees community engagement around this issue, it's just incredible how fast they get to the table. Um, so we were literally in a community of a thousand people in the middle of the cornfields of Illinois who had no broadband, who literally submitted a handwritten application for the program, got their community together, uh, started to talk to providers kind of around uh, who were engaged around or providing service around them, one of whom was sort of at the edge of the county. And as soon as they talked about bringing in outside providers, that edge of the county provider came in and said, oh, we'll upgrade service, we'll provide 100 over 20, so not symmetrical, but a heck of a lot better where they were before, just because they knew that the community finally engaged in trying to drive a dialogue uh, and they didn't want to be left off, you know, left out of the uh, equation. Go ahead. Can Kat. we also pause for a moment and just note that you said that a town in 2020 is, I assume, when this application was filed, had to use paper because they didn't have good, robust enough internet connections to file that in 2020. Right. That's exactly right. And by the way, they struggled with Zoom on the first meeting. And now this grandmother who's driving the application process. You know, I love these stories. Zoom <laughs> and doing all this stuff. I mean, it's just the most heartening story. Yeah. Um, so let's go and talk about, because we've, we've sort of talked about this relationship between the feds and the states about uh, broadband policy and funding. And really our last, uh, again, FCC, <clears throat> we saw restrictions 
for instance, in the FCC's Rural Digital Opportunity Fund that actually hindered federal state funding cooperation. So let's talk about why that kind of federal state local coordination is so important. And also why is it important to take all of the agencies that GG listed early on, including by the way, the Department of Agriculture, mm -hmm. um, which was not in her list, but plays a very important part in rural areas that we try to have a more synchronized approach between these federal agencies that just isn't talk, but actually has some teeth. Whoever uh -huh. wants to go first, <laughs> beside the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, coordination is essential. Uh, and what we found through our research is that coordination across state agencies in particular is very important. You look at a state like California, for example, which like, you leave California and everyone's like, oh, we can't use California as an example. California is a great example. It's a complex state. You have, you know, you don't need me to launch into this, this diatribe. But California has a very strong collaborative process across their state agencies. Why? Because they recognized early that broadband touches many different subject and policy areas. So education, agriculture, community and economic development, healthcare, the list goes on and on and on. They bring those folks to the table to facilitate to the best that they can facilitate that coordination and that communication. The more that we can do that, the stronger off these programs will be. Um, because we talk about this at the national level, million, many millions of Americans who don't have access to broadband. This is inherently a local issue. It is a kitchen table problem. That is why we need to have states at the table talking to federal leaders. That's why we need to have local and community engagement too. Because it allows, it takes what is a huge macro problem and brings it down to an actionable level. And I mean, I say that because, you know, you look at differences across states. Fundamentally, we're looking at geographic differences, topographical differences, plains, rocks, marshes, land, I don't know, prairies, whatever. So, you know, you have those differences, but you also have a difference in providers. So while a solution to focus on engaging cooperatives in a state like Minnesota will work very well, that's not gonna work in California. So you need to have states and localities at the table to elevate the solutions that will work best. Um, but Adrienne, to go back to your point about ARDOF, one of the uh, biggest criticisms, criticisms that we heard from states coming out of that process was the communities that were now ineligible for funding, um, possibly for as long as up to a decade. So it so the response from several states was like, you know what, even if a community is technically was covered through the art off auction, we're ignoring that because we don't know when that funding is going to come through. So we'd rather if they're eligible and they qualify for our program, they will get funding and we'll deal with the issue as it happens. So I just think that the part I think one of the significant um, value adds that the Biden administration can, can bring to bridging the digital divide is figuring out a meaningful way to facilitate better coordination between federal and state government and local government. This isn't about a federal or state or local response. It is an and across the board. We need investment, public and private dollars from every level of government and from the private sector as well in order to solve this. Yeah, it's, it's fusing federal funding with more trusted and knowledgeable state and local entities. That's absolutely mm -hmm. right. Gigi, did you want? Yeah, it's interesting. So the FCC's broadband maps is different map, is different than uh, the Department of Agriculture's broadband map, is different than the Commerce Department's broadband map. I mean, that's yeah. just crazy, right? I mean, so you're making funding decisions. And, and just so people know, the Department of Agriculture has something called the Rural Utility Service, mm -hmm. which gives uh, both grants and loans uh, to build infrastructure uh, in rural America. So what you get is you get, you know, duplicative decisions. Uh, you get, you know, areas that are unserved that don't get any money at all uh, because we're not singing from the same prayer book, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, as far as the states are concerned, I, I complain about this all the time. Adrian knows that I, I'll get phone, I'll get, you know, calls from, you know, uh, somebody in the governor's office or state legislator 
you know, at least a couple times a month saying, you know, what's the best model for, we want to fund broadband. What's the best model for, you know, uh, for doing that? And how do we restore our authority? And, you know, so if you got everybody together and built a blueprint and then everybody gets, you know, gets their role in executing it. And again, you're singing off the same maps and the same mm -hmm. data set, uh, you know, and good ones, hopefully. You're just going to make smarter decisions. Uh, yeah. So I just, it, it's, it, Unfortunately, again, uh, if it sounds like I'm beating up on the Trump administration, I am. <laughs> Some of the decisions around including states were just, well, that's a blue state, so we're not going to allow, you know, that, that blue state gives broadband money, so we're not going to allow them to participate in the, in the RDOF auction. I mean, it was just purely to punish so-called blue states. Uh, I, I, that kind of decision making is going away, has gone away already in the Biden administration. So uh, I don't think it's going to make a difference. It's going to be all about how do we get broadband to every household in America, not, you know, who voted for a Republican, who voted for a Democrat. You know, one of our board members always says that when you get to the state and local level, this is a nonpartisan issue. It is. Only when you get to Washington that it becomes an R versus D issue. And so, yeah. and fr frankly, a lot of local Republicans are kind of pissed off about this approach. And wow. so let me, <laughs> so let me actually, because this is a good segue, I think, about the emphasis over the last four years on fixing broadband in rural areas when from a sheer numbers perspective, three times as many people in metro areas don't have access to fixed broadband. So how has framing the problem as rural versus urban um, you know, affected uh, policy previously? And is the Biden administration going to continue this dichotomy or take a different tact? You want me to, I can do that. I mean, yeah, go ahead. look, um, it wasn't just the framing. The, the Trump administration really had no interest in helping communities of color and helping low-income Americans. They were, they again, they were interested in feeding the base or what they believed would feed the base. Uh, and that's why affordability uh, just didn't, you know, just didn't, emanate from their lips. Uh, I think what you're gonna see, what you're already seeing is an emphasis on both. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I talk to the press a lot and they're always looking to pitch a fight. So I, I got a bunch of phone calls a couple of weeks ago saying, well, isn't Biden gonna focus now on affordability to the exclusion of, of rural America? And no, the rising tide is gonna lift all boats, both in urban America and rural America, but you're gonna hear a lot more about urban America when you didn't hear it about it at all for the prior four years, it's interesting. So last week, the House Energy and Commerce Committee, which has oversight of the FCC, had a hearing that focused largely on affordability, right, during the pandemic. And you could see already um, sort of the, the industry freak out that, oh my God, they're talking about cost. They're saying our service is too expensive. You know, because that used to be the third rail, you could never talk about prices. Well, that's starting to change, right? And, you know, regardless of what the price is, people can't afford it. So, um, you know, for industry in particular, they don't want to talk about affordability because that raises the question, are your prices too high? Uh, What's, why do we need data caps? You know, what's the purpose of data caps? Uh, and that makes them very, very nervous. But there will be, if Democrats get their way and the administration gets their way, there will be money for affordability to make broadband more affordable. And there will be money to build infrastructure uh, in rural America. And the question is to me, and I've been looking a lot more oddly enough after you know, trying to punch the government for years to say, talk about affordability. I'm now actually looking a lot more at the rural side and how we've spent the money and not wisely. And how do we ensure that if we are giving money away uh, to companies to build infrastructure in rural America, how do we make sure we get what we pay for and whether a giveaway is the smartest way to do it or whether something like an infrastructure bank, which gives guaranteed government loans, whether that might not be a better way or a way 
of making sure these networks get built as opposed to just like I said, here, take the money and come back six years later. That has not worked. Absolutely. No. <clears throat> Catherine, go ahead. Or actually, if you're no. still thinking about it, let me just make no. one point about the yeah, right. The dichotomy that, you know, uh, it's only about affordability in metro areas and it's about access in rural areas is really untrue because, again, as evidence yeah. by our work in Illinois, there is just as much of an adoption problem tied to affordability and literacy in rural Illinois and rural, in, rural, in the rural U.S., as there is, there may be less of an infrastructure issue in metro areas, generally covered by cable, but it's not that it isn't an affordability or literacy issue also in rural areas. So I just hate that kind of stark, you know, divide and trying to, you know, right, make it about us. Yeah. Right. And it's also, it also ignores challenges in suburban communities too. Like let's pull those folks in. But I think the, the adoption issue, it comes down to resources and economics. I mean, it comes down to income. I mean, that's a, and that is true, rural, urban, suburban, whatever you look at. I think the other thing that we haven't really talked about today too, is also we're only talking about building new infrastructure. So to solve some of these urban or more densely populated uh, infrastructure problems, we have to talk about upgrading. Yeah. So, you know, the best data in the world, the best, which like I would argue, let's just get better data and not the best data. So there's that, but like, you know, the best data in the world, you know, we can set higher speed minimums rather than setting a goal. Like we can do all those things, but if we also don't do things like allow for the upgrading of infrastructure, which I will say you did see some states using CARES Act funds to do, um, and to do things like do service drops, we are still going to have this underserved issue, particularly, or unserved in some cases, in the urban communities that Gigi was talking about. So like, this isn't just about, you know, breaking down those urban and rural barriers, and it's just about getting smarter in general about how we write policy to actually meet the challenge on the ground. And we can't oversimplify, we cannot continue to oversimplify urban, rural, unserved, underserved, overbuild not, like, there is more nuance to this discussion that we do ourselves a disservice and end up wasting money by um, not acknowledging that. Yeah, I think that's right. So listen, I wanted to get to a topic that Gigi touched on earlier, and obviously with uh, California State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurman, giving opening remarks and also the um, uh, challenge that this group has issued. I would say that the, many of the people on the phone may be interested in this, but um, the pandemic has obviously particularly laid bare how our lack of universal broadband impacts online learning. And what has been the homework gap became a full on learning gap. And Gigi again alluded to the fact that the PI FCC said rules for the federal program for schools and libraries called E rate actually prohibits schools and libraries from using their excess capacity to address off-campus connectivity. So Gigi, I thought I'd like to ask you to expand a little more about what the FCC is being asked to do by groups like the Schools Health Libraries Broadband Coalition, by now states attorneys general, a huge number just uh, weighed in on that. And actually Congress may be appropriating other funds, but please um, let's talk about that topic here for the group. So, so let me explain uh, former Chairman Pai's rationale for not making uh, E-rate money available outside um, the school grounds. He did say <laughs> when Shelby asked, you know, could, could kids use it, you know, uh, outside the school building? He said, yeah, as long as they're on the school grounds, they could use it. What he, what he was clinging to uh, was that the law says that the funds have to go to the classroom, right, to provide to provide broadband service, you know, to and inside the classroom. Well, the classroom is now, I'm pointing below, that's my daughter's bedroom, okay, or it's the dining room table. And an agency like the FCC has a great deal of discretion 
in interpreting uh, the laws that it implements. So I cannot imagine that if the FCC were to say, um, not just in this, uh, in this emergency pandemic environment, but from, for, from here on in, the classroom is not just that building with the desk and chairs, it also includes uh, you know, the home. So therefore we will provide some of this money for connectivity to the home that any court would say that the FCC doesn't have the ability to do that. So that's essentially what these groups ask is to reinterpret the Communications Act and specifically the, the E-rate provision to interpret the classroom as being in the home. Uh, and as I said before, number one, I'd love to see anybody challenge it. I think they would become public enemy number one <laughs> right off the bat. Uh, and number two, you know, it, it, I used to be a litigator litigating FCC cases uh, in the federal courts. This is exactly the kind of interpretation of a law that courts say give agencies great deference and great discretion uh, to interpret. I think that's exactly right. Thank you. Thank you, Gigi. Uh, so I'm going to ask a couple of other questions and then turn over to the chat. These are sort of more generic questions to end. I do see some activity in the chat, but I think that because uh, Michelson has been very interested in the equity issue, look, we see so far radical differences in the makeup of federal appointments between the last administration and this one. And since addressing racial inequity is a big goal for the Biden-Harris administration, I just love you both to address how a di more diverse federal leadership and workforce can impact a more diverse America. Uh, well, I, at its most basic level, um, diversity adds different perspective. It adds different life experiences. Um, it just helps enhance our understanding of what challenges and opportunities different types of communities and different people have across the country. Um, it's difficult to uh, create policies focused on racial equity if you only have white people around the table. Um, I think you look at our field in broadband and it's rare that you have a panel full of women. And it's rare, I mean, and we need more people of color. We need pe more people, we just need more diversity in our field, but certainly in policy making to make sure that we are actually crafting policy that meets the unique needs and challenges of communities. So we need more perspective. Gigi? Yeah, I mean, look, lived experience is critically important in policymaking. I mean, I don't have much to add to what Kathleen said. I think she hit the nail on the head. Uh, and, and if you don't understand the experience of diverse communities, it's probably not gonna be part of your policy package. Uh, and it is interesting, I, a person who, who is very prominent but remain nameless uh, here, it approached me with being part of a project to look at what broadband policy should be, uh, you know, in the, in the next 10 years, you know, like a sort of a new national broadband plan. And the proposal he gave me was completely devoid of any context around racial equity. And I just, and this was mind blowing, right? <laughs> or, or the effects of the pandemic, it wasn't even mentioned. Yeah. Was like, excuse, whoa. So um, one of the things that troubles me greatly about um, uh, the policy community that Catherine and I live in is it is not very diverse. There's a fair number mm -hmm. of women, but you know, uh, people of color, it's, it, it, it's, it's a very, very small pipeline. Mm -hmm. and one that uh, I think needs to be a focus. The FCC, I mean, I will say actually to Chairman Pai's credit, uh, he did start a diversity pipeline and the Federal Communications Bar Association, which is the voluntary bar association for communications lawyers like me, has also started something. It should have been started years ago, but it, it's something that really, really needs to be a focus, particularly as the FCC, in my opinion, the FCC's really number one, two, and three priorities need to be closing the digital divide. So if you don't have people with different you know, lived experiences, making that policy, you're, you're not going to come up with a policy that works. Yeah. 
I think that's exactly right. I mean, we again, we found that as communities plan that these steering teams have to be very inclusive. Every, you know, every type of person, uh, residents in the community, anchor institution leaders, people from local government, and obviously, if the community is racially diverse, then the then the team should be racially diverse too. And I think better outcomes. Uh, we see better outcomes from that process. Uh, okay, so final question, guys, which uh, again, we've sort of danced around um, and I wanted to just talk about, um, look, we have an agenda to bring broadband for all. And so the question is really what uh, suggestions you have for people on this call, what do you think they should be doing? And what priorities advice would you give this group uh, about how to move the build back better um, with broadband agenda forward, whether it's in California itself, um, because I do see in the chat that some thought that this might have been a more California oriented panel. So if you'd like to take a little more time to talk about California, mm -hmm. uh, Catherine, I think people would love that. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, let's end there and then we'll take a look at the uh, questions in the chat room. Uh, okay, so um, sorry, do you want me to touch on California or, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, sure. uh, so I think the, um, one of the benefits of the Biden administration's approach uh, is as Adrian outlined at the top of this discussion is the fact that broadband is embedded in just about every policy priority uh, that uh, the president has outlined. Um, so whether we are talking about racial equity, increasing economic mobility, uh, addressing the climate crisis, I mean, the list goes on and on. Broadband is, an inher is a, just a critical underlying, underpinning foundational component of all of those things. Um, that principle is something that the state of California has embraced for a very long time. Uh, so the more that we can, as partners, peers, advocates, researchers, community organizers, talk about broadband's role in advancing and supporting and enabling all of these areas, these issue areas, I mean, that is how we will push and achieve, uh, push towards and achieve universal access. Um, the more that we can talk about how broadband is essential to our economic future, to our economic health and well-being, um, not to mention just like, you know, our human health and well-being as individuals, um, the more folks we will be able to bring to the table. Uh, so I, I just think the, um, uh, and that was actually something too that struck us about our field research in California was hearing about how um, leaders in the state really looked at this as part of the state's economic future. This is part of the state's economic vitality. And it's not just because of Silicon Valley. I mean, it also has to do with agriculture. It has to do with tourism, um, you know, many, many other issues. So um, the more that we can embed that ideology in the way that we think about public policy responses, I think the better off we will be. Um, one of the other things that we didn't talk about that I do just want to flag um, that is a wonderful strength of the California program is its regional broadband planning consortia um, because of the way that it enables a, a bottom-up approach of community engagement um, where those planning groups can then collaborate with state, identify federal funding sources, um, and achieve in some cases better economies of scale. But I do think that when we talk about lessons learned from states, that is always something that we point to in California that the state does very well. Uh, so anyway, sorry, Gigi. Can I just add, can I just add uh, first of all, congratulations to California um, because it's net neutrality law, which is the strongest in the land, uh, just got upheld by uh, a district court judge. Uh, the, the Biden Department of Justice dropped out of the case that the, the, uh, the challenge was brought by uh, the Trump DOJ and also by a bunch of broadband providers and this uh, district court judge ruled from the bench which really meant he was not convinced uh, by industry arguments. And what California did there, uh, which was really important, was again, take back its authority. Believe it or not, Governor Brown gave away a lot of uh, the state's authority over broadband and this took it back. I would advise folks to you know, follow groups like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which I am a little prejudiced, I am on their board, 
uh, term, the, uh, I, I don't know what it stands for, it's uh, Utility Something Network, T-U-R-N, and then the Green Lighting Institute, they're, they're all working at state, on the state level for a good broadband policy. One bill that did fail, unfortunately, um, it died in the, uh, uh, in the assembly, would have um, had the state build community networks in low-income areas. It was SB 1130. And it was actually sailing through and then um, it, it died in the assembly and uh, quite unfortunate, hopefully they'll try again. But there's been a lot of activity in this space at the state legislature and those three organizations and Consumer Reports as well as another organization that has um, offices in California, very, very active. I would say follow those folks. And when they call for people to weigh in do weigh in because unfortunately, and this is a, happens a lot in the state legislatures, there, a lot of them are very, and it doesn't matter whether Republicans or Democrats, right? The speaker of the assembly is a, a Democrat, a very, very close to industry. And this is why we have all those bad uh, community broadband laws in the first place, because you know the, 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 the telecom or cable lobbyist goes to their buddy at the state legislature and say, this could pass this law for me. It's, it, you know, we shouldn't have, government competing and because people ask me, well, why would state legislatures do that? Because they don't know any better, mm -hmm. right? And, and you know, so educating state legislatures, I think is really important, although they know a lot more now than they knew 20 years ago. Uh, and following what's going on in the state legislature, I think is really, mm -hmm. really important for making good broadband policy. That's right. Those are both terrific answers. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'm going to just turn to some questions in the chat. A lot of it has been comments, but I did want to, we haven't talked about devices. Um, and uh, someone uh, pointed out with all the funds that tech companies are sitting on, they could get a, give every child a laptop and that would be a start. Uh, and so um, part of the emergency broadband benefit program actually does provide money for devices if the household contributes a very small amount uh, toward the price. But, and COVID funds obviously have really been used a lot to address this issue by states themselves. But um, maybe uh, one of you could address whether there has ever been a suggestion or an approach to tech companies to do this kind of thing. Well, all I can say is I don't understand why one government dollar needs to be spent on devices when you when you have you know Microsoft, Apple, and Google all making hardware and making goo gobs of money. I don't I don't understand it to be perfectly honest. I think they're asked in localized, you know, like in, you know, local communities or school districts will ask Apple, will you provide, but there's, you know, again, this is one of the problems while um, I agree with Catherine hundred percent that the, the action is at the states and should be at the states. There still is a need for federal coordination. Imagine if Joe Biden bought in Tim Cook and Sundar Pinchai and Tasha Nadella and Jeff Bezos and sat him down in a room and said, okay, guys, come on, <laughs> you're gazillionaires, your companies are making, are printing money. How about providing devices for, you know, every needy kid in America? That, you know, rather than what Trump did was come in and beat them up over whether they took down its posts or not. So um, it just, that seems to me to be a no brainer, maybe something that will get done but yeah, I've never understood why, you know, uh, why we had, why Congress needed to waste its time. It's not, not a waste of time because a lot of people don't have devices, but why given the wealth in that community that that problem just doesn't get solved like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now I do want to point out in the chat, one of my favorite city examples, and actually I was surprised to see somebody from Cleveland on, but I just want to read this because uh, I think Cleveland is really out there in terms of a really robust community foundation that has taken the lead with a number of different partners. Uh, but this really, they've done extensive work, this chatter says, on the digital divide in policy, social policy research, digital literacy programming, organizing, and youth voice. And they point to a history of the digital divide in Cleveland. I also note that the National Digital Inclusion Alliance did some very good work in Cleveland and really was the first time they used the digital redlining term was on that report. And then of course it got done in others. 
And uh, they talk about uh, working on a digital access map led by Casey Morris at Microsoft. But I do think that, you know, there are just these great examples of cities doing robust ecosystem work, not peeling apart one problem from the other, but kind of looking as Catherine keeps saying holistically uh, at the issue. Um, and I do want to get to Dr. Michelson's question, uh, which was how do the, here you go, Dr. Michelson, the, how do the panelists feel about the need to in fact declare high speed broadband a utility? Uh, and so, uh, and this was a question, Dr. Michelson, I, I remember you asked in the last panel I was involved in. So I think it's always uh, good to bring this up and talk about this. Uh, and then he has a part two of the question, but let's hear from either Catherine or Gigi about this. Gigi, you're the attorney, you take the first pass. And what I say, basically what I say is to the extent that broadband is essential in electricity as electricity and water and gas, yeah, it's a utility. You know, that's a separate question about whether it should be regulated by a utility, like a utility. But to me, it's just, it, it's, it doesn't matter. It's something that everybody needs to have. Uh, and it, it's, it, again, I think some people would rather give up their water and electricity than give up their broadband, so. Well, you know, what, what I'm concerned about is um, legislation uh, is too often an asymmetrical warfare. If you look at the great wealth of the uh, internet providers and they have a vested interest in this, when somebody submitted a piece of legislation to you that you thought was not up to par, my first response was I was probably a lobbyist that gave it to him before he gave it to you. Um, we see that every day. And I think that's what the battle is here. And I'm a little bit concerned that at the end of the day, the money of we the people will actually go to simply enhance the profits of the very people who've been throttling down the speeds, who've been, uh, their, whole, their whole model ha has been one where they appear to compete to the average consumer. But in reality, they're, re they're aligned in this concept of maximizing the profit per customer. And I think that's really an issue. I disagree with you. And there are people who have, who have criticized the emergency broadband benefit as just you know, sticking more money in their pockets. I guess my feeling at this point, particularly during the pandemic, is we've got to get people online, right? Understood. Right, yeah. but we, we can't really be about enhancing their corporate profits in the long term. And, and of course, they have more politicians in their pocket than we the people will ever have. Yes, and that's why I think community broadband is so critical, right? I mean, I, I, that's why I think, you know, having local governments, like the federal government is not going to build, you know, their own networks. I mean, there, there is actually some conversation about that, uh, but I don't think it's very serious. And I think you want to talk about coming up against lobbying power. I, I just don't think it's, it's, it's viable. And it's not just, it's mo it would be mostly Republicans opposed to it, but you'd get some Democrats as well. They just spread too much money around. Let, let me let me throw this in real quick, if I may. I'm an, I'm I'm a pilot, and when I trained, we had these things called VORs. These are high frequency radio transmitters, and GPS blew that out. And then they came up with this little thing called WAS, where there's a ground unit that enhances the accuracy of the GPS so much that there's it does away with ILSs and all these other things. There is a technological answer to this. If we could get Purdue and Caltech and MIT to start competing for the prestige of it to come up with this next technology. We don't know what it is. No more than the people who are using the telegraph could believe it'd be television. It's out there. And, and as the federal government should be driving this kind of competitiveness, and the real reward isn't the million dollars that, 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 that Superintendent Thurman talked about. It's believe me, if you come up with that technology, you're gonna serve billions and make billions. And everybody else can have low cost, super high speed, internet. And I think we really should be pushing on that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. The more, the more that communities and, and, and even states can build their own, uh, you know, the more you get away from, you know, the, the corporate model, which is, is a regional monopoly model and a high cost model. I mean, you know, average broadband cost for promotional with promotional prices is $70 a month and 83 without. I mean, that's just not, 
it's outrageous and it puts us very near the bottom of developed countries uh, in terms of broadband price. I mean, bottom meaning expensive. Yeah, the, we're, we're the third highest in the world based on that. Now, actually, we keep talking about community networks, but Dr. Michelson, clearly there's what there are other models either with electric co-ops, I think that, you know, also have a different motivation than profit, which is they're all about delivering to their members. And I think we've found that, the, that especially in rural areas, those become very robust models. Obviously, the Chattanooga model, which is quite unusual for a number of reasons and maybe not the best model to hold up for a whole lot of other, I mean, just a confluence of events that made it sort of perfect. But the uh, electric co-ops are slowly getting into the business and I think, you know, provide another healthy alternative to um, profit motivated, uh, you know, broadband companies. I saw that the, the, the rural co-ops and I believe it was Virginia, Delaware and one other state, uh, maybe Maryland, are actually joining together to build a larger network. So that's, th those are, those are huge. Uh, uh, those could be really, really huge for, you know, promoting more public oriented networks. Yeah. And, and sorry, Catherine, remind me, which was the Southern state that, that there were restrictions on uh, co-ops getting into the business and they overturned it? Was it Georgia? Um, well, it's, so it's a matter of overturning or just clarifying. So in some cases it is a mat, it's reversing existing law. In other cases, it's just saying, yes, co-ops are allowed to provide service. And that clarity piece is, we have found is very important in states um, to help get more folks to the table because unless it is outlined in law um, or in funding requirements, um, you know, you're not going to have new entrants engage because they're worried about lawsuits, understandably. Um, you know, one thing that we are looking at are the, um, well, they were model or pilot programs. Now they are actual programs in Virginia and West Virginia, where you have um, uh, utilities uh, who are upgrading their middle mile service and leasing the excess conduit. So, you know, you're again, how are we sort of, what are the various levers that we're using to bring down costs of deployment for the last mile? How do we open up open access? Um, it just is again, like, let's put as many options on the table as possible. Um, but I do think to Dr. Michelson's point, you know, we do need to have a discussion about how do we value this service? Um, we talk about it in the same way as we talk about electricity, water, roads, it's an essential service. So how do we draft policy um, that reflects that and enforce that policy and subsequent accountability and oversight measures as well to make sure that we are uh, getting getting what we have paid for. Um, thank you both for that. And thank you, Dr. Michelson, for your great question. Um, I also want to point out in the chat, there's some really wonderful discussion about California students and some of the players, including the California Tech Emerging Technology mm -hmm. Foundation that's done a wonderful job. Uh, there was a lot of ratification about data being lousy and trying to get better data, um, uh, a ratification about RDOF not being worth it to um, California to apply. Same in the state of Illinois, by the way. Not but, just RDOF. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry. Uh, but I do think that um, I'm not sure there are really any other uh, questions um, but there's really, I, I do encourage people to read some of what's in the chat, uh, particularly the last couple of entries about computers to kids in San Diego um, and some of the other players um, who are active in this field. Um, and so I don't want to read these out loud because I think if you all just press the chat function at the bottom of your screen, you could actually read these. Uh, Miguel, I'm not sure if I missed any other questions that you think I should address, or maybe we'll just wrap up a few minutes early. I think we're, I think we're good. There are a handful of questions that we can get to on the back end, uh, Adrian. Okay. Uh, but definitely um, can wrap up here. Um, thank you, Adrian, and thank you to all of our panelists for today's insightful conversation. Uh, before we go, we'd like to announce another way in which you might be able to engage with the Michelson 20MM Foundation in our efforts to eradicate digital inequity. 
on March 8th, 2021, we are launching our inaugural Digital Equity Spark Grant funding cycle. Through this program, we will be funding projects that aim to support systems level initiatives with potential to create positive impact at scale and inform public policy in California. Our focus areas include education and awareness, research and scaling best practices. Through our SPARK grants, we introduce an innovative just-in-time grant-making process to meet the urgent needs of organizations aligned with our focus areas. Our Digital Equity SPARK grant funding cycle will be open until March 29th, 2021. Please visit 20mm.org forward slash SPARK grants to learn more. This installment of Connecting California was presented by the Michelson 20mm Foundation, in service of advancing digital equity for all students and families. We wanna thank our foundation partners, the California Community Foundation, the Angel Foundation, and Southern California grant makers. We'll post the recording of today's discussion on our YouTube channel, the Michelson 20MM Foundation by tomorrow, and include links to the video description so that you can join our Connecting California LinkedIn group, a dedicated space uh, to foster collaboration amongst California's philanthropic community to advance digital equity and close the divide faster and together. As we continue on this journey together, we'd love for you to share your thoughts with us to continue to improve our efforts in the chat and in the follow and in the follow up email, you'll receive a link to a survey to give us your feedback. Please take a moment to complete it. Every bit of information helps. So thank you in advance for taking the time to complete it. Remember that digital inequity is one of the most pressing social justice and educational issues of our time. Because it is a monumental effort, it requires as many actors as possible working to solve the issue. It's a forgotten social determinant of health that dictates whether or not we are able to access education, healthcare, search and apply for jobs, and even me meaningfully engage in our democracy. If you or your organization want to become part of our digital equity work, please reach out to me personally at miguel at 20mm.org. You can also stay engaged by signing up for our newsletter at 20mm.org to receive news and updates about Connecting California, as well as our other events and programs. If there is any media present, please stay on the Zoom line for a few minutes. We'll be happy to take your questions. Uh, with that said, thanks again for, uh, for joining us, everybody. Have a great uh, rest of the day, and thanks again to our panelists as well.